I'm Colleen Maiko. And I'm Peg Tillery, and I'm delighted to have you here in my garden today at the beginning of summer. We've got some tips for you today that we hope will help you all garden season long, like clever ways to deter pests. Peg's going to show us some of her fabulous roadies and azaleas. And I'm going to make some bouquets from Peg's beautiful lush backyard. So let's get started on this episode of Planted. problems with pests in your garden? You are not alone. It's the number one source of frustration for gardeners. Today we'll have some tips to protect your edible and your ornamental landscape from pest damage, including ways to deter rabbits, rodents, and birds. And even from adorable creatures like Patty. What is a pest? No, not your kids or significant others. <laughs> Things that harm plants. We're talking about maybe insects or pets, anything that destroys your plants by eating, tunneling under it, or trampling. Some of the most difficult pests to deter are rabbits and rodents. And it's made even worse because some people just feel like it's a kindness to feed them or they leave their pet food out. Rabbits and rodents, like mice and voles, like to chew on the tender new growth of plants. You can tell a lot about what pest is da causing damage by the pattern it leaves. Rabbits, for instance, will often chew at a 45 degree angle, leaving a clean cut. These pests will gnaw into the bark of woody shrubs and trees, leaving telltale teeth marks. This can kill a plant outright or simply stunt its growth. Birds will eat seed before it even has a chance to germinate, and they also love to taste fruit to see if it's ripe yet. Some rodents tunnel underground, some of them eat the roots and the bulbs, others just by their tunneling uproot the plants. Deterring pests is all about prevention. The important thing to know is that if you're using just a single technique, it's likely to be unsuccessful. Combining deterrents that are tailored for your specific pest and your specific plants is gonna be the key to success. Research shows that physical barriers, like fences, are the number one way to control vertebrate pests. That's the four-legged kind. Exclusionary techniques, like plant cages, trunk wrap, or bird netting, will help you protect individual plants or small groupings. Well-constructed fences are the best way and a long-term solution to protect larger areas. We have a selection of barriers to share with you. One of them is floating row covers, which you saw in episode one. And we'll also talk about bird netting. The thing about bird netting, it, you lay it over the fruiting plants that you want the birds not to nibble. But you have to be really careful because some of the bird netting, the birds get caught in it. So it's good to monitor it regularly. And you only really need to use bird netting as the fruit is, is um, on the plants. Some people prefer to use a finer material to protect their fruit, like maybe screen or tool from the fabric store or mosquito netting instead of the traditional bird netting. If you use these materials, make sure that you put it over your plant after your insect pollinators have had a chance to work their magic. Otherwise, there won't be any fruit for you or the birds to enjoy. This is my favorite rabbit deterrer. It's a wire cloche and um, it protects emerging bulbs in the spring, the hostas when they first pop up, lilies when they come up, dahlias when they come up, anything tasty to rabbits. You can make your own though. This is one that a neighbor made and 
it keeps the adult bunnies out. And by the time um, her plants emerge, when the little bunnies could make their way through here, um, the plants are tall enough and mature enough where it doesn't matter, and the little bunnies won't eat them. There's also fencing that I put around my perennial beds that Patty likes to dig in to make a nice little bed while we're sitting out on the patio. It also goes around the pea vines because Patty's figured out he can reach up and nibble and they're very tasty. He also likes green beans. So this <laughs> keeps Patty, it's tall enough when you put it inside these raised beds that he can't reach up there anymore. You just have to be sure that the vines are on the other side of the fence. Rabbits are just as likely to climb under as they are to climb over. So to create a rabbit barrier, use chicken wire staked at two to four foot intervals. You're gonna want two feet above ground and six inches below ground. And these one inch holes are too small for even baby rabbits to climb through. You can make your own temporary protection for individual plants or small groupings of plants with things like a milk jug with the bottom cut off. You can use a strawberry basket upturned. You can make your own wire cages out of in, any sort of wire. This is, has really fine tiny holes. This is good for rodents. I've made this cage with quarter inch hardware cloth. And this is for a larger plant. So you can tailor your material, whether it's a metal mesh or a plastic mesh, with the openings that are small enough to prevent your particular pest. And then you build your barrier for the size of your plant. You want to monitor these frequently because you want to make sure that your plant doesn't grow through and become damaged by growing through the holes or growing into the top of it, and you don't want wildlife to get caught in it. To prevent tunneling pests, lining the base of raised beds <coughs> with quarter inch metal hardware cloth can keep voles, moles, and other diggers from your potatoes and flower bulbs. Another way to reduce rabbit damage is to garden with plants that rabbits don't like. The Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife has a list of plants that rabbits tend not to like on their website. By changing out some of the plants that are frequent casualties with some of the plants <laughs> on this list, you may have less damage in your garden. But keep in mind these kinds of lists are not foolproof. A hungry animal will eat just about anything. So another way to deter rabbits especially, is to get rid of the areas where they like to nest and multiply. So cut down blackberries that are anywhere nearby or take them out entirely. And also sometimes too, you might want to mow down tall grasses that are nearby. There are repellents labeled to use on your plants to prevent vertebrate pests from eating them. But the results research shows are inconsistent. Also, some of the ingredients in repellents can burn or defoliate plants, and not all of them are labeled for use on edible foods. So, if you're gonna try these, make sure that you read the label and follow it to the letter. Knowing your pest and what it needs to survive are very helpful. So, our favorite resource is from Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife their website, and Living with Wildlife in the Pacific Northwest by Russell Link. Good luck, and here's hoping that all of your pests are as cute as Patty. We're starting a new feature today on Planted. It's Plant Showcase, and today's flower is rhododendrons. Our Plant Showcase is rhododendrons and azaleas that are part of a thousand species 
in the rhododendron genus. So the original taxonomists had them separate. Azaleas had about five to seven stamens. Rhododendrons had around 10. So they kept them separate, but now they are all the same genus. So all rhododendrons and azaleas are rhododendrons. In addition to the stamens on the rhodes and azaleas, they actually, every bloom, if you look really closely, you'll see these little series of dots. And those are actually bee and bumblebee runways. They attract pollinators, not just the bees, but other pollinators. It's, it calls them in and they go in and gather the pollen. It's really cool. Rhodes and azaleas both have deciduous where they drop their leaves and they also have evergreen where they keep their leaves. And so this, um, this is an example of an Xberry azalea and the leaves are fairly soft and um, they change color in the fall. It's amazing. This one is called President Roosevelt. And um, you can see this is the newer growth. This is the older growth. So this year's growth last year's growth and the year before. And um, rhodes, all of the rhodes and azaleas that um, have evergreen type foliage, they lose about a third of it every year. So this old growth will fall off and then next year this will fall off. One of my favorite rhododendrons is actually kind of small um, leaved and it has um, lovely purple flowers that come out in February. And um, it's called PJM. And um, the new growth, the, the very new growth that comes out is bright green, bright green, but then it starts turning to purple. So in the fall, it will be purple and um, it doesn't lose its foliage, except of course, you know, a third of it every year. So new growth, about one or two years old. Another variety of rhododendron is called Yak for short, Y-A-K, but its full name is Yakusomato and from Japan, of course. And um, it has this wonderful fuzzy furry covering on the back side of the leaves. And that's called indumentum. And so um, some people try to rub it off. Don't do that. It's part of its beauty. Supposedly, they tend to stay fairly short. All the ones in our garden are as tall as I am, if not taller. You really want to know what you're getting when you purchase a rhododendron because they want to be trees. There are some small varieties and you can ask a nursery person how big the rhododendron is going to get. But behind me are the original rhododendrons, uh, one set of the original rhododendrons that came with the house. And they have grown into humongous trees. They were pretty big when we bought the house 28 years ago and now they're almost 30 feet at least tall. And then behind me here are rhododendrons that we planted and they quickly turned into trees. So you don't want to put rhododendrons close to your house. Two local nurseries not very far from here are Chimicum Woods in Port Ludlow that have species rhododendrons. And then there's Whitney Gardens that's um, in Brennan. And Whitney Gardens is also a full service nursery. So they have websites and um, you want to go check them out like February through June each year to, to look for good rhododendrons. There aren't very many downsides to rhododendrons, but some people think they're really messy. And um, maybe they are if you look at the ground around where I'm sitting, but they rake up really easily and they go in your compost bin or in your yard waste bin. And so um, I find the beauty of rhododendrons outweighs the messiness. One little caveat though is the sepals that are around the blooms are, um, they're quite sticky. They're these, these just, and parts of the blooms too. They're sticky. So our adorable Sheltie dog, Patty and I track these 
things into the house. So you just have to pick up more often than other times of the year. And rhododendrons are fairly disease free. There's an amazing publication from Washington State University Extension, EM091. You can purchase it online or it's free download. So you can just download the PDF onto your computer and refer to it anytime you want. A question we're often asked is, do rhododendrons need fertilizer? And the answer is, not usually. We, we have never fertilized any of the rhododendrons in our garden, but sometimes they may need fertilizer. And um, EM091 and a master gardener and a good CPH nursery staff person will help you figure out if your rhododendron ever would need fertilizing. The main thing is site selection put it in a spot that, that is good for that rhododendron. There are some that like sun, some that like shade, and they do need water to establish them. Plus, they will need water during our really hot, dry months, and even in the wintertime if we don't get any rain. So there is um, a, dis a disease that rhododendrons get, or a condition, um, called rhododendron bud blast. It was also called rhododendron bud blight. So you'll see both terms. And it ta talks about it in EM091. But um, it's um, inoculated by a little leaf hopper, which is really kind of a pretty thing. It's bright green with red stripes. So bud blast or bud blight kills the buds. That's why you don't want it. And that's why you want to look out for it. And what would happen is if I didn't take this off, um, and dispose of it in the garbage, the next year it, it would happen again and just year after year and eventually the plant becomes so weak that it dies. There are um, weevils that chew around the edges of rhododendron leaves. They come out at night if you want to see them and um, they just nibble around the edges of the rhododendron. Some people don't like messiness so you know there are varieties that are resistant to root weevils. So we chose rhododendrons for this plant showcase because we love these plants. But we will be showing you other plants at future plant showcases. Special thanks to local artist, Elise Watness, for painting the beautiful Pacific rhododendron for this episode. Watch for more local art on future segments of Plant It! It's natural to want to bring the beauty of the garden indoors, and making a bouquet is a fun and easy way to do that. If you've never made a floral arrangement, no worries. Grab your pruners, your imagination, and let's find some floral inspiration. Flower arrangements make a statement. Whether composed of a single blossom or many, Flowers send a signal that you care about the details and flourishes that make a house a home. For guests, flowers are a welcoming signal that you consider their company special. For those who like to entertain, flowers are another creative way to play on a theme, set the mood, and complement lovely food. And a homegrown bouquet makes a thoughtful gift. One that you can even compost when you're done with it. You don't need much to make a bouquet, just a sharp pruner or even a scissors will do in a pinch. A bucket full of water to collect your flowers, and then something to display it in. You don't even need to own a single vase. You can use a mason jar, or a water glass, or even wash out a wine bottle. I use the hand pruner for cutting larger diameter stems, and the snip for tender, slender, leaves and stems and with these things in hand I'm ready to go out into Peg's garden and find some inspiration. What kinds of plants are good for arrangements? Well I guess the answer is what do you got? I like to go out into the garden and look for different colors and foliage textures and just find some inspiration. Peg's garden is full of beautiful rhodes and azaleas and just one flower cluster, called a tress, can make a bouquet all on its own. It allows you to appreciate each individual floret up close and personal. 
Now I just have to find some colorful foliage to go with it, and voila, instant bouquet. Early morning when it's still cool is the best time to cut flowers. Try to cut a long stem from the plant if you can. You can always cut it shorter when it's time to put it in the vase. Some flowers last a long time, others just a day or two, but that's okay. That's gardening. Enjoy it while it lasts. Get some flowers on your windowsill that maybe have a punch of color or fragrance and enjoy. Flowers don't have to be in full bloom to look nice in a vase. When you think about the flower buds of roses, Consider some of the plants in your garden and experiment with what will unfurl gradually in a vase, lasting longer. Spent flowers can be just as decorative as a full bloom. One of the plants I love for that are hellebores. They look great from start to finish. They change colors as the ovules swell and the seed starts to form. I also have in this arrangement the seed pods of pulsatilla or pasque flower. That additional texture and shape is very pleasing in an arrangement. I grow flowers just for cutting, but if you don't have a lot of flowers in your garden, you can always buy some stems and build around them using what you do have. We have wonderful flower growers locally who sell their flowers at the farmer's markets during season. So go out and check out what you can find locally because the stems are gonna be fresher usually cut just the day before, so they'll last longer. And they'll have a smaller carbon footprint than some of our store-bought flowers, which are shipped to us from across the globe. The international floral trade relies on wild-collected native plants from the Pacific Northwest for the green component to commercial bouquets. So how lucky are we that we have sword ferns, salal, huckleberry in our gardens, or maybe your neighbor does. And I'll tell you what, they make the most beautiful bouquet. This bouquet doesn't need any flowers to be beautiful. It, all the greens can stand on their own. And who says that greens are only good for winter arrangements? A handful of leaves from ornamental grasses make a fun linear component to a bouquet. I especially like yucca and sedges. And one of my favorites is this beautiful forest grass. It's so graceful in a vase. Leaves that are big or patterned are colorful, are wonderful in a vase. This hosta beautifully sets off the more delicate flowers. And in this vase, we have these colorful hookara leaves, which really pull out the deep colors in the iris. I have a selection of vases that I've purchased, mostly secondhand. I'm a sucker for little vases and pitchers and even shot glasses. But you can always slip a ho-hum vase or recycled jar into a tin or even use a decorative bag to add a unique touch. Florist bouquets from the store usually come with a packet of flower food. However, when you're making homegrown bouquets, you don't need any of that. It's more important to change the water every day. When you have an arrangement and that bacteria builds up, it will cause the plants to decline faster. Always recut your stems when you put them in the vase and you're making your arrangement. Cut the stems at a 45 degree angle because that clean cut is going to take up the most water, extending the life of the plant. And I will recut the stems just a little bit every day when I change the water. Commercial arrangements often come with floral foam to hold the flowers in place. But you won't need this, and it's not sustainable, so take a pass. If you have a shorter vase and heavier flowers, you can always use a piece of chicken wire to anchor it into the bottom or use some decorative rock or even some beautiful gems that complement your flowers for good anchoring and spacing. You may have heard the terms balance, symmetry, or proportion, all potentially intimidating terms to describe the art of floral grouping. Never mind all of that. This is all about having fun and enjoying your garden and just working with what you have. Don't worry 
when it comes from your own garden that a spendy stem is going to get wasted or that something doesn't go together. Just enjoy it and bring the beauty of the garden indoors. Thank you so much, Peg. You and Patty are fabulous hosts. I had such a good time in your garden, and I really loved learning about what inspired you to be a gardener. Well, we loved having you here, and I'm really looking forward to enjoying all the bouquets throughout my house. Oh, that's my pleasure. Mm -hmm. Viewers, we're glad that you joined us for this episode two of Planted, and we hope you got some good tips about how to keep the critters at bay and that you'll keep an eye out for our next episode when we're going to get out in the community and meet with some local experts and garden lovers that we are very inspired by. And we hope you'll enjoy gardening in this late spring and into summer and get out in your own area to explore. Because the more you grow, the more you know. You'll find helpful information on deterring a variety of pests in Russell Link's book, Living with Wildlife in the Pacific Northwest, and online at the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife website. Washington State University has wonderful online resources for what works and what doesn't when controlling vertebrate pests like rabbits, deer, and rodents at Gardening in Washington State, Portsense, and WSU Snohomish County's website with principles of vertebrate pest management. Links for this episode are posted in the description for this video or you can find it on the BCAT YouTube channel.